Hello. On behalf of the Victorian chapter of the NRCOP, welcome to the webinar. I'm Chris Singham, uh, and I would like to begin by acknowledging the first peoples of Australia and New Zealand and the, the various nations that we're on, uh, either uh, physically or virtually. We're streaming live and all the webinars are recorded and will be made available on the ANZOG YouTube channel. Uh, we'll be using the Q&A function in Zoom for questions. So we're leaving a good chunk of time for, for Q&A with the panel. So, so please submit your questions. And if you like the look of another question, you can upvote it. So a, a bit like Eurovision, uh, popularity counts. Now, where we do not get to all questions in the hour, the panellists will try and give a written reply afterwards, and that will be made available with the various post um, post webinar resources that will be up in the following days. So uh, to the panellists, uh, uh, Cassandra Ma is Executive Director of Service Reform and Corporate. Uh, Cassandra is at the Centre of Digital Government Reforms in Victoria. No pressure, Cassandra. She's also an experienced executive regulator. She started as an economist with the Productivity Commission. She helped restructure railways in New South Wales and Britain. She then worked in the finance sector and she came to the VPS in 2011 and uh, her roles included leading the Victorian biosecurity regulator. She has a master's in commerce and honours degree in agriculture and resource economics and a postgraduate qualifications in project management and applied finance. Uh, Miriam Slattery is Executive Director of Registration, Screening and Crime Prevention at the Victorian Department of Justice and Community Safety. As you can tell by her title, she's an executive level regulator. She's also reviewed native vegetation regulation. Uh, she left the uh, public sector in 2016 to be head of stakeholder relations and public policy at Netball Australia. Uh, she came back into the, into the public sector to work in the office of the Chief Executive Officer at the City of Melbourne as head of strategy and partnerships. She's headed up births, deaths and marriages, adoption service, worker screening, uh, and so on. And she also worked uh, as Director of Infrastructure Department of Prayer and Cabinet. Finally, Craig Lloyd, CEO, City of Whittlesea, uh, uh, and before that, he was also CEO, CEO of the neighbouring Murrindindi Shire Council. Uh, so, and is uh, here because he's a leader in local government on end-to-end uh, -end digital systems, which I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about. Uh, and he, uh, he was also uh, an executive in the Victorian public sector, and he holds a Master's of Business Administration and a Master's of Project Management. So the plan for this session is uh, Cassandra Ma will speak to us for about 15 minutes and then Mim, uh, uh, or Miriam and Craig will respond and after that we'll open up for the conversation. We'll be taking questions from uh, the online audience only. Sorry, packed room of attendees here. Uh, and so let me, without further ado, hand over to Cassandra Ma. Um, thanks, Chris, and thanks very much for the opportunity to um, come and talk to you today about how digital technology can really transform regulators and streamline um, the citizen services and services for business as well. Um, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. <laughs> um, so Service Victoria, many of you will know, we're the most downloaded app last year um, in the country. Um, many of you will know our services from check-ins. Um, during the last five years since we were created, we've done quite a lot of stuff in the digital space. Um, what I'm going to be talking to you about today is really about Tell Us Once and putting the customer at the centre. This is important because it helps to drive some digital transformation around how we think about regulation, but also how a customer um, or a citizen or a business experiences it, increasing compliance and improving regulatory outcomes. So just from the onset, I'd like to talk about regulation as this is a regulatory audience. So often we think about regulation in three parts. One is, um, uh, if you like, the licensing and permitting. Two is around compliance and three is around enforcement. 
Sometimes people get upset when we talk about customers with respect to regulation and there's good reasons for that from regulators. It's very hard to be happy when you get fined or when you're a series and you're in trouble for being enforced about something. Um, so really what we're talking about in this space is really thinking about that first step, which is around permissioning and licensing, making it really easy for the customer when they have that first interaction with the regulator or with government in terms of preventing harm and the important role of that. So just wanted to draw that out at the start. So this slide just gives you an overview of some of the things that Service Victoria has done. You can see we've got a huge number of services now on our platform. I'll be talking about those. We've got increased number of services being delivered through the Service Victoria app with more than 5.8 million downloads. What that means is increasingly people are becoming more comfortable with digital technology and this is a preferred channel. Customers want to be able to use a digital channel to engage with government and they don't really distinguish between different parts of government either. They don't understand. Um, and what we know is that there's an easy way to reuse different parts of digital services. So that's what I'll be talking to. So just going to the next slide. What we're aiming to achieve really through this tran transformation is to start to think about centering services around the citizen or the business. So rather than having to navigate your way across a mire of different government agencies and regulators at different levels, starting to think about really pulling that service into one place so it's me.gov, not me going to different places across government. So for customers, that means they want to be able to see everything in one place and this helps to enable Tell Us Once. So that means they want to be able to see their holdings. So do I drive a car? Do I own a car? When's my registration due? When's my working with children check due for renewal? What notifications or reminders might I need? And having one place to go instead of that really hasslesome process of having to have numerous different, um, if you like, passwords to remember where you need to log on and getting this really cluttered life. So a really simple way of interacting. What that means is being able to centre the services around customers and businesses and notify them, let them know ahead of time when something's due. They can just log in and see it really easily. If you think of your best banking service, um, it's really thinking about adopting that, but across a whole lot of services for government so you can see it all in one place. Now, for regulators, this has a number of benefits. The first one is really around the fact that you can start to actually take the account and transform it into a wallet. We know more and more that people don't want to be able to, they don't want to carry around a wallet. They've got their card, they can tap with where they go. So instead of having all these physical tokens, you can start to put them into a digital place. Now that digital place is enabled through an account and being able to see those tokens or those cards or permissions, being able to know that they're current. For a regulator, that also means being able to withdraw it so that physical thing doesn't exist anymore out there and that you can be more confident in the moment that the person who's coming to do your um, electrical work or your plumbing work or the person that's turning up to look after your kids, they've got a working with children check or they're qualified. So the ability to hold those tokens for individuals and for people who are consuming that service to be able to check those services as well. So what that means is that enforcement and compliance function is actually in the hands of everyday citizens to be able to check when we enable this and it provides us additional checks and balances within the system because when done well, you can actually check these tokens in real time with the technology that we've got now. So what that means is in some instances, like with fisheries in Victoria, we've actually enabled a, a, another app, which is an enforcement app that enables fisheries officers to check that someone's got a fishing licence up to four metres away, including on boats in Melbourne, Port, Port Philbert, Phillip Bay in Melbourne. So the ability to use this technology in innovative ways to check and allow citizens to check as well. So this slide really talks to thinking about the ability to save and store and have that within the mobile app. Just going to the next slide. Um, this is enabled through thinking about modular design. So what we're not trying to do necessarily is digitise everything in one place. There's a lot of work going on. Miriam and Craig will talk to the great work that they're doing. How do we bring this together to make it simple and easy and be able to see it in one place so customers can tell us once? 
So what we want to do is think about that customer design and many of you will have heard about human-centred design and journey mapping. So bringing that lens into this space to be able to think about that journey, make it simple and easy and understand which bits can be delivered through which technology solutions um, in an integrated way. So through Telesponse that really helps to reduce the friction in that a customer has a seamless or a business has a seamless experience. But in the back end we may be um, connecting with multiple services. Um, so how we do that is really by having a great legislative framework in Victoria through the Service Victoria Act, which enables for reusable identity credentials. So what that means is prove your identity once and you can choose to reuse it again and again for up to 10 years. Um, and enabling the reuse of other things like, for example, we've got on the left, the right hand side there, payments or accounts. So they're built once and then able to be leveraged across the Victorian government by any local government or state government agency. Um, what that means is we need to work together really to be courageous in owning the customer as a state rather than as an individual entity. And it means we need to be able to collaborate and learn from each other and understand where things need to be different. Just going to the next slide, please. So some of the challenges in that landscape are really around thinking about the customer as a customer of a government rather than a customer of an individual service. And then really thinking about what privacy and convenience means. Now, our research at Service Victoria shows that customers value trust and integrity equally. And what that means is they want to have something that's easy and they want to be able to trust government. So they do expect that it's not going to be so simple, but we've got to make it really easy for them. So to do that, what we've really thought about is enhancing the privacy and security experience of our customers so that they have choice throughout the process. But we've separated out the idea of being able to... Um, know someone, verify their ide identity from the permission that's being granted. So in the case of our partnership with working with Children Check, um, Service Victoria does an end-to-end -end transaction um, and Miriam's team do the assessment to determine whether they're eligible to have a working with Children Check. But that customer experience is seamless. The decision around the permission to work with children always resides with the regulator, but it starts to then leverage some of those synergies and economies of scale and simplicity around better technology at scale. So to do that, we really need to think about minimising data collection and what we're going to do with storage. And writing a really good collection notice up front is a good way to start because we think around what are we collecting, why are we collecting and minimising that information. Now, for regulators, the challenge is out there because in licensing and permissioning, you need to think about why am I collecting this information? How will it reduce harm? And that's the question we ask our partner regulators. If it's not there for a reason, it shouldn't be collected. And that also helps to simplify the experience. Similarly, from a Service Victoria perspective, we think around simplifying and standardising as many steps as we can so that when you're doing a transaction, you can tell us once and we can reuse that information over and over again with your consent. Just going to the next slide. So to do that, we take a really standard approach. We call this the GRID. The GRID doesn't relate to an acronym. It's just the GRID. Um, and you can apply this in your everyday life. I'd encourage anyone to have a go at this with any service that they have. We start with the first step, which is inform. You are really clear up front um, around what you need to do before you start. If you've got everything that you need, what's it going to cost? What do you need? And then ask the customer to identify themselves, either as a business or as an individual, collect that personal information and be clear around why you're storing it and what's going to happen with it and who you're going to share it with. Assessment. And this is where the step with the regulators is really important. This is our partnership step. What assessment information do we need to collect from applicants in order for them to apply for that permission to work with children, to be a plumber, a builder, a teacher? Um and making sure that that's consistent wherever possible because what we know in the assessment step is that there are little mini steps in there that are the same. So, for example, national police checking. Um, that's a standard step that happens across a number of different regulators, but there's different types of police checks. So being really clear around that assessment information. Payment, standard module that you apply, so that's either a payment in or out. So you might be paying a grant, for example, or giving some money back. 
token is really the idea that you're getting a receipt or a digital token or a card in your wallet and then feedback always the opportunity to provide feedback Um, we use a thumbs up thumbs down so it's either good or it's bad pretty quickly and then just an opportunity to provide some verbatim around that just going to the next slide So how are we going? So with these reusable modules that we've got in place, we've actually done things in two ways. One, we've done what we're doing with Miriam, which is built an end-to-end service. And two, we're doing what we're doing with a number of different agencies. We've actually enabled some of these capabilities like identity verification and payments to be made available across the public sector. So once you've told us once who you are and you've saved it, you can then reuse it across any of these services through Service Victoria and this list is growing all the time. What this means is it reduces the burden for regulators in having to prove identity but at the same time it improves the customer experience and it improves the ability to be more confident around who someone is because the more you use it you actually satisfy one of the proofing objectives which is use in the community because you're using it a lot. So the next slide just describes the same type of functionality but for payments. You can see again we're working across the Victorian public sector. Some of these are part of integrated um, services, so end-to-end things on the platform, and some of them are just a a service that we offer to help pick up with that digital um, technology and that side of things. Just going to the next slide. So finally, what we're trying to do through TELUS Month is make it really easy for customers and regulators. We do this predominantly through a Service Victoria account, linking in those holdings and then enabling a customer to see everything in one place. Um, What's really important around that is we need to recognise that the customer is a customer of government and really think about their experience, put them at the centre and make it easy for them to know what they need to do to comply. And that will help also support regulators to focus on what's important, which is regulating your palms more around the compliance and enforcement. Um, We need to plan up front for integration. So there will be digitisation and Craig will talk to this around happening across the whole of government. doesn't mean we can't have a conversation around how to make this a reality. And then finally, I just really wanted to talk to that assess step. Really look at it carefully as a regulator. The more special you are, the more time it takes to do these steps. The more we take a rules as code type approach when you're looking at um, kind of yes and no answers or things that you can check back to source, the easier it is is going to make that process simpler. Um, And we can start to use um, accounts, um, digital tokens and single sign-on as a start. You don't need to, for example, have an end-to-end process or transaction to have your token in the Service Victoria wallet. We can do that through checking back to your back end. So happy to have um, a more full discussion with the panel. Thank you very much, Cassandra, for kicking us off. I'd like to now go to Miriam. So Miriam, Cassandra is also already mentioned you and how you might fit into this total picture so can I ask you to take over? Sure Um, just checking this works yes well feels a bit weird Um, as Cassandra said I work at Department of Justice and Community Safety and I have the benefit of having two business units that have different functions but relate to this program so worker screening unit within that I've got working with children check and NDIS worker screening and then in birth deaths and marriages we have an entirely different unit that is about creating identity Um, so I'll just start with worker screening unit quickly Um, working with children check I think has had a relationship with service Victoria for about four or five years so they've been able to renew online etc etc and that just obviously makes things easier for the customer Um, NDIS worker screening we implemented early last year um, and that again um, has I think a really good success rate and it's going really well. There are obviously a number of issues though where people can't transact digitally um, or don't have the right identity documents Um, and the concern we often have and we talk a lot with Service Vic about this and we've got a number of projects underway is closing that gap so that it is easier to transact digitally but also knowing that our job might be to find those people and help them get their identity so that they can have an account with Service Vic or for those that will never be able to do that find an alternative way. Um, I, I think the thing in having BDM in my remit as well means we've got a number of projects where when people come to birth, deaths and marriages now they can prove their identity via Service Vic 
but often they're coming to us because they don't have an identity document. So it's a little bit chicken and an egg. So we're working with Service Vic on how to fix that because, for example, they come to us because they want a copy of their birth certificate, but we need them to prove their identity first, but they need their birth certificate to do that. So it's a little bit um, circular, but th these are the projects that are underway right now. Um, I will just highlight some of the, the issues we've had are obviously ministerial accountability. Um, we work to the Attorney General in my department and Cassandra works to the Minister for Government Services and obviously we've got different acts. Um, but ultimately what, what our sort of big principle is, is we're trying to make this work so that we, each party does what they do best. And as Cassandra said, um, we're good at assessing and regulating um, and we want service fix assistance to work better with customers so that they can come in and it's e the, the first part is easier. Might take longer for us to assess for a variety of reasons, but that we get that seamless transaction at the start. Um, and that's the really important part because once you've got a service pick account and you've proved your identity, you can then do all our services and it makes it a lot easier. So I will finish there and I'm sure there'll be heaps of questions. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, now I'd like to invite Craig. So Craig uh, is CEO of a, of a very large and growing uh, LGA. Um, where, where do you and your, your council fit into this picture? Yeah, thank you. So yes, it's city of Whittlesey. Um, it's a fourth biggest council in Victoria and a very diverse uh, municipality. We're really excited about the work that we're doing with Service Victoria. Um, I, I think if you bring this all back to the end customer, what's really important here is that we end up with one entry point for people to be able to access all of their information, make all their transactions, no matter what level of government they're dealing with. And, and I think that's the really important bit. The complexities that are there for local government is um, there's a lot of us. Uh, we're the most heavily regulated level of government. But if you think about councils individually, we all make our own localised decisions. Uh, that's local democracy. So we do end up with quite a lot of variance in the services that are delivered. You know, uh, The services that we might deliver in, in, a, in a city area would be very different to a really rural council, for example. So from a systems perspective, that will present some challenges. There'll be different uh, local laws. There'll be different uh, fees that are applied. But fundamentally, the service is the same. So I think that's the piece of work that we're really excited about doing is working with our partners at Service Victoria and the other councils to work out what are the key systems and things that we should go with first. Where, where are the, the big bang for the buck for the customer? So we're really excited to be uh, involved in things like the new online rates system. So for as a bit of an example there, um, if you're an owner of an investment property, you'll be dealing with potentially multiple councils at the moment. Um, you'll also be dealing with various levels of uh, different departments within the state government. How good would it be if you can log into the one place, see all of your properties, pay all your rates in one go, and the system takes care of the distribution of those funds and those notices to the relevant councils? So I think from a customer's perspective, this is, this is a huge, huge opportunity. One of the big challenges for local government is um, no matter which council you're from, I suspect we, we're all hooked into a lot of legacy systems. Every council is using a different mix of those systems. Uh, so that transition is going to be challenging and can be one of those things that we really, as a sector, are going to need to, to work through. I think the strength, though, of local government is that connection back to the community. We are the level of government that is the closest to the community. We deal with them directly every day. So in our case, for example, we have a very large percentage of our population that can't read and write English. What does that mean to a system like this? What does it mean to our online presence generally? So we're going to need to advocate uh, on behalf of our community to make sure the services are accessible, no matter what language you speak or, or, or what um, level of access to IT that you might have, particularly in rural places. So that's the kind of information and the kind of work uh, that I think councils can do to be able to support this initiative that we think is really important. Well, thank you very much to our, our three presenters. And the good news is got through it very efficiently, so we've got lots of time for questions and discussion. So I'm going to do that annoying thing and use the facilitator's prerogative just to kick off with a, a few questions. Uh, Cassandra, um, what was the burning platform and, and, and how did the sort of uh, whole of government buy-in come about and was that a difficult sort of process? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, so Service Victoria is originally created back in 2015 
at the time, Victorian government services were ranked well behind in terms of customer service, other states and territories. So that always makes a really good imprimatur to improve the service. Um, but there's really um, good economics behind it in terms of trying to improve the service for customers and make it easier and also making it easier for government departments and regulators in terms of streamlining that process. So what we do know is that um, technology is challenging, as Craig said, and if we're able to simplify that technology and make it available to other regulators, particularly the smaller and medium-sized regulators, that really makes it more accessible to improve services in a really simple way. So there is a good good story behind that. Um, what Miriam said is absolutely right. We know for a fact that only 80% of customers want to transact digitally. So that means that there's 20% of customers out there who um, either don't want to or can't transact digitally. And we know that that's changed a little bit through COVID, so the numbers come down somewhat. But there are, you know, there's really good research that we've done to understand these customers and through collaborative working, like with Miriam's team, we really want to make the services that we have more inclusive. And I think that's a big objective for government as well in terms of inclusive services that are accessible in a way that our broadly multicultural society can really um, do what they need to do with government. And it's all about participation and being able to protect the community from those harms and for communities to get those services, whether they're regulatory services or whether they're actual financial support, for example, with um, cost of living or recovery from COVID, like we've done a lot of voucher schemes or Get Active Kids is a great program as well. These services are of interest to um, Victorians and they help improve outcomes for the economy and for the community. Thanks, Cassandra. So, uh, Miriam... What can you give us, just following on from that question, so thinking about your very large government department as a whole or that particular screening function that's been mentioned that you're in charge of, uh, again, what, what, was, what instigated change? What, what was a, how did the momentum build? Um, firstly, I'll just say those decisions were made before I got there by great people who did a lot of work about four or five years ago. Um, but I think the the burning platform is really just making it better for the customer, particularly with the two units, because I've got birth, deaths and marriages as well. Often difficulties compound for people. So they come to us to get a birth certificate because they need to do something else. So they, they might, it might take them a while to get a birth certificate from us, then they need a worker screening from us, then they might need to access another government service and it just compounds the timeline. So it might end up taking them five months to do something. It just makes sense to try to make that front end part far simpler and quicker. So once they've got the first thing via Service Vic, they just can jump around other services. So I'd say definitely that was um, a burning platform. I think there's no doubt though for us as well, um, in terms of the change management piece, there was some scepticism, there still is, um, because of the people that can't transact digitally and may never be able to. Um, I think the one benefit of COVID, not that there are many, was as Cassandra said, people sort of started to trust digital processes a little bit more. And for us in particular, implementing NDIS worker screening was really difficult last year, like we had a lot of challenges. But ultimately we ended up getting to a point where we were actually going a lot better than other jurisdictions because of the digital process we had. So in a way, even though there is still a bit of scepticism, we ended up showing that the model can work and it can work better for the customer. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Craig, you've given us a sense of, a bit of a sense of the before and after, a reference to a patchwork of legacy systems and, and so on, which gives us a sense of uh, your burning platform. Can you talk about... Um, uh, your LGA's experience, business case, working through and whether you're starting to reap the benefits now? Yeah, I, 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 we definitely are. Uh, look, I, I think if you bring this again back to the customer, we're playing catch up. The customer expectations now is that they can transact with local government and other levels of government online. And we're constantly getting the question is, why can't I do that online? Um, because you do that with the other energy companies, you do that with the telcos and everybody else these days. So why can't I do that with council? 
So, yes, we're playing catch up. We've recently gone live with uh, a brand new building and planning online system end to end. It's the first in the country and it's built on the same platform that um, Service Victoria are using. And the feedback has been absolutely amazing. So that's that's big developers using that system, but it's also your mum and dad that are putting in an application to extend their house or a shed. Um, they can now track that application all the way through. And, and I think the other thing that um, customers are asking for and our community ask, is asking for is more information. People want to know where their application is at, what's happening with it. They don't want to just wait for that letter to arrive in the post. They can now log on and see the comments from the planner all the way through the process. They can ask a question of the comments that the planner's made. They can adjust their application on the way through and self-serve. Um, people don't want to sit on a phone waiting to get through to council to try and track down the right person. They want to do that themselves. And, and this is a huge step forward for us. We're going live uh, next week with a brand new system. Again, same platform for our hard waste collection. Um, that's one of our biggest services, waste. Uh, is about 80% of calls into council are, are waste related. It's it's amazing. Um, so this will uh, this will free up capacity again within the organisation and certainly within our customer service areas, but result in a better outcome for our community as well. Thanks very much. I'm going to turn to a few questions that are coming in online. Uh, so we've got uh, a comment and a question. Uh, uh, I'll read it. From my own experience, technology is not the challenging part of the transition. The most difficult part is really to seek buy-in from executives. So can panel members share some tips on how to get management involved and implement the change? So now's your chance, panel, if there are particular <laughs> objective, uh, executives that have really annoyed you, name and shame. No, but seriously, um, how do you go about that storytelling, building the case, uh, getting beyond that, well, why do I have to do it? sort of um, attitude? Yeah, it is a really good question. Um, so getting executive buy-in is critical to success. So um, what we found is that without that executive buy-in, things stall or they take a long time. So making that case for change is often about um, what Miriam's talking about. It's about seeing what the benefits are. So um, at Service Victoria, we work in partnership with a number of departments and agencies to find where those benefits are and to be able to help tell that story that you're talking about. Um, sometimes we do it through thinking about um, a proof of concept or thinking about what it might look like. And so actually painting the picture of what that looks like. Um, increasingly, we're able to use um, digital technology to make that happen a little bit more quickly um, to really show what it might look like and where the benefits are. Um, listening is a really big part of it to understand where the pain points are. So in our partners, that understanding of pain points and how this benefit's going to be realised and what, what challenges it's going to help overcome is important. If there's not a good reason to do it, then it's it's not going to get ahead. So I think that partnership with us in terms of um, painting the picture, but at the same time you can't paint the picture unless you understand what problems you're trying to overcome and how the solution might actually improve and show what those benefits could be. Thank you. Same question, uh, Miriam and Craig. Um, I will just quickly defend executives just quickly because this could be directed at go. someone like me. Um, um, I think I referred before to ministerial accountability. There's lots of stuff going on behind the scenes in the legislative framework that does mean due diligence needs to be done. So sometimes executives are a little bit hesitant because we've got to line up all the, the systems and processes because we are accountable to a minister that is ultimately accountable for the entire process and carving off bits to give to another area can involve some issues. So that said, as Cassandra said though, putting yourself as a user, so imagining yourself as the customer is the way to overcome that. So every time I start working on these issues or get a new member of the team, I always tell them to have a go, try to get your birth certificate online, try to do this, try to do that. And it's interesting because when I started in my role, I actually didn't do that for the first two months and I got caught out in a very senior meeting when I didn't realise how the process worked. Um, and one of my colleagues said, first thing you ever do in a new job is test every service you have as the user. Um, and so I think that's how you make the case. Because if you're in a meeting and someone's being sceptical, you say, well, why did it take two weeks to get this done? Or how, how is that working like that? We've got to fix the system. This is our job. So that's the answer. Craig? I think certainly in our case, um, it, it's such a compelling case from our community that convincing our executive has been 
pretty easy, I have to say. I think the the biggest challenge with local government in general will be us signing up to systems that are operated by the state government. Um, and that's not being critical of the state government, but there have been examples in the past of systems that have been delivered by the state government for local government that have not been uh, very good, being polite. Um, so I think that that will be the challenge. Uh, and I think in, in some councils, um, obviously politics plays a, a role, but I, I certainly think that um, with the executives across councils in general, we're all hearing the message very loud and clear. We're also frustrated by our own speed of moving to online technologies too, and an opportunity to partner like this and, and fast track, hopefully, some of those key services will also take the pressure off the organisation as well. So I think it, it's, a, it's a no-brainer from our perspective. Thanks, Craig. We've got a really interesting question here, which uh, relates to, I think, uh, the enablers. Um, so you, you mentioned the Service Vic app and uh, making sure the legislative and regulatory settings are right. So the question is, have you considered how the technology being used might impact the legislation you are required to follow rather rather than the other way around? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. So we um, recently amended the Service Victoria Act, thanks to our Victorian politicians for passing that. So the amendment went through in um, March this year. Um, it's a fantastic amendment because it does some of those things that you're talking about which enable for technology. So one of the things that it did was it recognised a digital token as equivalent to a physical one. So that is quite enabling in terms of um, thinking about being able to deliver services rather than being wedded to having to send a paper copy and an electronic copy at the same time. So that's really important. The other thing that we did in thinking around technology and outcomes was our act had been really strict around the storage of data you cannot store any data. And this prevented us from working with a number of different um, agencies. If you're thinking about smaller agencies, it doesn't make sense that they necessarily own their own systems. If you think about Amazon Web Services or the cloud, they all exist and hold data, but you have your own part of that that you own yourself. But we were prevented from acting in that way. And so these amendments to the Act enable that. Um, there was a recent review of the Service Victoria Act, which was tabled in Parliament at the end of June, and it recommended that we do another review of the Act in 12 to 24 months to make sure of this exact point that we're not cutting off technological options in order to implement. And in a really basic sense, that means our legislation needs to be more outcomes and principles focused. We need to look ahead and have a clear vision. Um, and we need to keep some of the detail in the subordinate legislation. We have a legislative instruments and policies and regulations that we can change more easily. But it's, um, it's a really challenging space because technology is evolving. And the best way to understand this is to work in agile teams. And I'm constantly learning from our tech team um, who come up with great things and ask great questions and just having collaborative conversations to understand techno technology, its possibilities and how it works. So it's just a, a huge and expanding area. Thank you. Um, I've got a very specific question. When will we see a Vic digital driver's licence? <laughs> And also, uh, if I may, to add on to it, I hear in New South Wales they have one, but they've been having some trouble with rental car companies and the like accepting the electronic version. So no pressure, Cassandra, but how are you going to solve that and when? Um, <clears throat> tomorrow? No. Um, <laughs> that would be great. Um, so just talking about um, digital driver's licences in Australia. So um, Queensland, New South Wales and South Australia all have digital driver's licences and Victoria doesn't have one at the moment. Um, with the, the work in New South Wales, I can't really comment on the detail. Um, there is work that's going on in Queensland if people are interested in interoperability and digital tokens, which is some great work. And they've got an event happening in December to test out the new interoperability international standards. And what that's about is being able to easily share information that's held on digital tokens that's trusted between different organisations effectively, so making the tech interoperable. So there is work going on in that space. In terms of answering the question around Victoria, um, I'm going to have to say that that's a matter for the government and, um, yeah, feel free to ask um, your local member or the Minister for Transport, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Craig, I want to ask you 
around sort of roadmap for implementation. You talked about your very diverse community and so on. Um, so can you talk to us about um, Whittlesey's engagement processes, both sort of internal but particularly external around these digital reforms? Yeah, happy to, Chris. So I, I think, um, as I mentioned before, local government is the most uh, regulated, and I'll keep saying that. Um, <laughs> we're, we're required to engage with the community far more than other levels of government are. So any significant changes we're making to the direction of council, whether that's our um, annual plans, whether it's our major projects, whether it's major IT implementations, we need to conduct community engagement and, and seek active feedback, deliberative engagement with the community. So what we're working through at the moment, and this is a piece of work that's uh, live as we speak, is looking at what the priorities are for our community, working out what the priorities are for council. I think council's priorities are fairly clear. We want to start with the larger volume transactions first. That's where the, the economies of scale are for us, and it also reduces the pressure on our customer services. And it also gets the community using the systems as well. So we're working through that process. Part of that then will be looking at what, what does the community need out of that. For example, I mentioned before languages, but it's not just limited to languages. We're not going to be able to implement every language in one go. What are the priority languages that we need to, to go with? And one of the really interesting bits of feedback we had recently from our community is don't go with the most spoken um, languages that are not English in the municipality because in quite a lot of those cases, those community members and their families have been here for a long time and their English is very good or they've got people that can speak those languages. It might be more aimed at new arrivals that have less English skills. So how do we tailor the systems to work for them first? How do we partner with our local library services to help people that are, are elderly or have a, a, no access to technology from home? How do they operate? So it's, there's a huge piece of work for us to do looking at the community needs. Uh, but I think the council end of it is fairly uh, a fairly clear case. And, and Miriam, I mean, you also offer services to all Victorians and have that sort of uh, uh, challenge as, as well. Did, were there, was there anything you heard from Craig there that we, which is yep. sort of a common experience? Yeah, we sort of do the same thing. Obviously for worker screening, people are often job ready, so they are already got lots of their documents ready, but the volunteer check for working with Children's Check is the same thing. It's dealing with every single Victorian. So um, the more we can get out and communicate proactively about what's required, the better. Um, with births, deaths and marriages, we do a lot of outreach. Obviously getting that first identity document is really important. Um, so making sure we're going to people who need assistance to register births, for example, um, particularly First Nations people. We've done a great project over um, the last few years, even individuals in out-of-home care, making sure they've got the right identity documents so they can then participate in the community or the economy. So it is about targeting to the right, the right individuals, um, not necessarily because it's the largest cohort, but it's more the impact on them if they don't have access to the right services. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question which is sort of, I'd call it the feder the joys of the federation question. So we're, it's uh, obviously Victoria is the most important jurisdiction in the country. <laughs> Yet thinking beyond our borders, uh, the question is uh, uh, how do we support workers um, to uh, who move across the country to uh, have seamless uh, services from governments without having to go to each one? Yeah, that's a big question and I think it's been um, a challenge for a number of years. There is active work going on in this space. Um, so there's been some work on automatic mutual recognition happening nationally and there were some changes that were implemented last year around that automatic mutual recognition that for a number of workers moving interstate enables them to rely on um, – a license that they've got interstate in another state and then use that. Um, that's being implemented in um, in different ways across jurisdictions. Um, each regulator then needs to look at how that recognition works. Um, it's it's not necessarily a simple process. Into the future, um, there's some work going on on authentication. So I'm just going to explain two different concepts here. So what we've been talking about is verification. So Miriam talked about the need to get, for example, a birth certificate, a commencement of identity document, then you need a use in the community document and then your names need to match and they all need to be checked back to source and we check your photo and it's effectively a 100-point check online. That's verification. 
authentication is I've already verified myself and now I'm going to trust that that's the same person. So it's sort of like logging into your bank online again or being able to trust that somebody's given you something. So authentication means, and this is important in the context of a digital wallet, that you could hold tokens granted by other regulators in the wallet using an authentication methodology. So if you think about that, then what that means, and there is work going on at this at the moment, is that in my Service Victoria wallet, I could potentially hold what licenses generated not through an end-to-end process through Service Victoria, but they could be authenticated into the app and held in that one place, um, either from national, interstate, or other regulators. What that's enabling is the TALUS once in terms of seeing everything. It's like your physical wallet were replicated digitally without having to do that verification. What you don't get in that benefit is what Miriam was talking about, which is the reuse of that same identity credential for permissioning purposes. But what you do have is the benefit of seeing everything in one place which is one of the value propositions that a customer wants. They want to be able to see everything in one place and not, including me, have to have member so many different passwords for so many different things or have so many apps on on your phone, like just that clutter, make it easy for the customer um, and that experience of having to do it's really important. Yeah, happy to explain further if yeah, I need to. Uh, you know, thank you. Uh, I actually, I've got a question for whoever wants it. Or you can all take it. Um, every man, woman and their dogs is digitising in government sector, not-for-profit, private. Where are these people coming from uh, to help the different agencies uh, do the technical work that's required, replacing of legacy systems, so on and so forth? I'm happy to answer from our, our situation. So... It's a struggle, to be completely honest. Anyone who's competing for the best um, technical skills that are out there at the moment. Um, I think collectively we've we've got to have a look at that. We've got to look at what reskilling and retraining is required. You know, we've got a quite a large team in our in our council of, of fantastic IT people, but the skills they're going to require over the next few years are going to change. It's that's the way technology is. It changes constantly. So I think collectively, as a as a state, we're going to need to have a look at how do we collectively retrain people, reskill them, support them through that training. Obviously, there's younger people coming into the market too and we've got to be making sure early on that they're training in the skills that are still going to be valuable by the time they graduate, uh, not skills that are, are, are outdated. Um, but the market's very tight at the moment. Uh, it's a struggle and we're all competing for exactly the same people. So just further to what Craig said, um, the market is really tight and we do need to work quite collaboratively around what those priorities are. Um, some of the strategies are around reuse of things that are being built. So rather than build the same thing 10 times less, kind of focus in on those investments. I think Craig talked about prioritisation, which is really important so that we're getting the right people to work on the right things. But more broadly and strategically, the Victorian government has invested in Digital Victoria. And as part of Digital Victoria, they're looking at skills and capabilities more broadly in the digital sector and building up those skills and capabilities. And there's also some great work that's being done in the Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions in Victoria through Jobs Victoria, which is actually doing training in the digital space for mid-career people. And so there's active support to achieve what Craig's talking about to help retrain different people, think around what these skills are. They're not just the coding skills. They're many like data insights, lots of different digital skills. And so the ability to add those skills, particularly through micro-credentials and short courses, and then have a really great work experience because there is high demand to start to make that transformation and that enabling capability within the economy be there to be able to be utilised across all regulators and the private sector. Yeah. I think Cassandra and Craig have covered that well. <laughs> That's good. Uh, so um, I'll go to a question uh, that we've got online. So it's a question about how to 
get involved in the service VIC reforms. Um, so what's the process for other government agencies stroke regulators to engage with service VIC and draw benefits from the app? So that's pretty easy, just reach out. <laughs> um, I've got a great team of engagement people and um, we'll put you in touch with the right person and from there we'll be able to have some discussions. Um, just to further to what Miriam and Craig said, it is a really busy time at the moment. So um, what we're doing is constantly prioritising that work. We're trying to make it as simple as possible. So um, the dance card's a little full at the moment but and, and obviously resourcing is a bit constrained but absolutely happy to have those conversations what we're looking to do is really support digital transformation and the direction of the digital strategy 2021-26 for Victoria, which is by building up these roadmaps around that digital transformation agenda and really being clear around where those priorities are and trying to reuse and scale um, really simply and, and make it happen as quickly as possible. Another question is... Uh, do you think there's a place for this sort of digital service for regulators with only a very small number of customers? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, so there's all different types of digitisation. You can go super fancy at the end of end-to-end -end integration and bells and whistles with, you know, um, thinking about, you know, how you're going to check everything back to source, like, you know, documents or someone's address or whether they're a registered business. But for some of those smaller volume services, there's just as equally smaller, simpler tools, which councils are being fantastic at developing web forms. So there's ways of making a digital experience even for small volumes, um, whether you invest in a really highly technical solution or you're happy just to have something that's a little bit technical with more manual behind the scenes. There, there's, a, there's a myriad of options there. Good. I've got a tips for young players question for all of you. Um, so uh, for people who work in agencies that are maybe starting off on their digitisation, digital reform uh, journey, uh, regulators in particular, any tips, any red flags, any I did that, don't do that, <laughs> or, or just general advice that you could give? I'll start with this one. Um, I think it's just to be positive. As we talked about earlier, um, you've got to find all, like our job as public administrators is sometimes to find lots of the problems, which we're all very good at, um, but it's to keep the positive focus on the end point. So, you know, my staff, most of them are in their roles to find the issues to resolve. So they start almost, they, they get lost in the issue and then we've got to pull them back out and have their eye on the prize for want of a better phrase um, and that that is really difficult but I suppose that would be my, my best advice is your job is to find the pitfalls and then come up with a mitigation so you know um, this is the way we're heading you know COVID's made us realise that that people are, do want to transact digitally and it does make it easier um, we know that as customers it makes it a lot easier if you can you know people who have been trying to get their passports recently will know that, that if you can do things online and get all your other documents um, online and then go into the passport office of Australia Post or wherever you're going, it just makes it so much more seamless. So I think the, the case for change, being really clear about that at the start and talking about the pitfalls and sort of working through those issues as the group constantly. So constantly just having those check-ins every day. Why are we doing this? Let's think about the end user. Yeah, I think another one is um, just building off what Miriam said is don't let perfect get in the way of possible. So um, what we often talk about is a concept called minimum viable product. So what's the smallest next step you're going to take to get over the line to solve the next bit? Being really conscious of where those big problems are and knowing that you want to be inclusive and you want to capture 100% of people at, at some point, but you need to start somewhere. And so that minimum viable product idea actually lets you let go of some of those pitfalls, but you need to articulate what they are so it's really clear so that your success is actually measured against what you're trying to achieve. So having that narrative clear and being able to not let perfection get in the way of possible is important. Thank you. I, I also think it's um, knowing that you're not on your own on this journey too, that Pretty much every organisation is is heading down a digital path at the moment, and 
someone's always going to be slightly ahead of you. Someone's always found a solution to the problem you're experiencing. And there are some brilliant networks out there too to have these conversations and uh, work through how to do these things. And questioning yourself that if you're not on a digital transformation journey, are you really delivering what your customer needs? I think that's the public expectation now. We've got a question online, uh, which is, do you have any research, so you is all of you, uh, into whether ease of access using digital services has increased voluntary compliance and engagement? Um, it's a really good question. So we've got research that shows what customers want. We've also got research that unpacks um, customer and user experience, like if they're likely to, you know, complete a form, like what's the dropout rate, that kind of thing. Um, I think the question that is being asked is more around compliance and enforcement from a perspective of enforcing it, which is probably more a question for the regulators in terms of how compliance is being undertaken, yeah. Yeah, I think the stat that I don't have right now but that would be interesting is the Renew stat for working with Children Check as well and just getting the notification automatically, whether it means people do it straight away. I don't have the stat now but that would be something that would be, I would assume it's far higher because people would have missed the the, the post that used to go to them to say time to re renew your working with Children Check rather than getting a ping in an email. Um, yeah, I don't have the stat now though. No, uh, but I will ask a question, Craig. It, um, through, are you hoping to see uh, things such as if it's a, if it's uh, easier to organise a hard waste collection that you'll see less dumping or uh, things like that? You're, ho you're hoping for those sorts of benefits? Yeah, certainly hoping so. Um, but it's also an opportunity for us to review our processes. And one of the things that's been really uh, quite enlightening and, and well done to my team that have been working on this is as you start to pick apart the process to digitise it, you find a whole load of improvements in the current process. So the way that we currently engage with our customers and what we can and can't collect, how much we can collect and can't collect is actually a really limiting factor on the community and it ends up with things being dumped. So as we work through those processes and modernising those processes, that's probably where we're finding the biggest improvements is simply challenging the way we do things today. Final question, and it's for Cassandra. Ten years ahead, what what will all this look like for uh, citizen access to Victorian government services? Um, so ten years ahead, you'll be able to log in as you can now into one place and see all your services in one place. You'll have your app on your phone. Um, you can automatically go places and share credentials whether it's interstate or overseas potentially, and it's really um, non-burdensome to deal with government. That's what we're aiming for, yeah. Thank you very much. On that note, unfortunately, we've run out of time for further questions, uh, but I, I would like to thank uh, our panellists today for, I think, tremendous insights. Uh, so um, thank you again. Uh, to them and to our audience, both here in the studio and virtually. Uh, as regular participants of these webinars know, you'll shortly receive a short evaluance, uh, evaluation survey in your inbox. Uh, so please help us out uh, and fill it in. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Our next NRCOP webinar is in August. We don't have an exact date yet, but it'll be on building the cultural capability of regulators which I think we've covered a bit today too in this particular context. Uh, so make sure you join our socials. We're all about the socials at ANSOG. LinkedIn and Twitter. No TikTok yet. <laughs> um, so I would like to uh, thank uh, Marion Frere and team for uh, organising this today and thank you and all the best. Bye-bye.